Hello. Uh, today, I thought I would make a video about our power system up at the cabin uh, slash maple farm. Uh, as I've had a number of people asking me about it, um, I've given a couple answers here and there, but I haven't done anything kind of holistically. And today is a little bit special because we just made a pretty significant increase in our power. And I'll go over that in a minute, but uh, I thought I would go over our panels uh, as well as our power shed and kind of where we are, maybe where we've been and where we want to go. So we'll start over here at the panels, try to keep you out of the sun. Um, what we have is an array that started as ground mount um, we had it on uh, a two by four frame, uh, and then I ended up, uh, putting in this, uh, system, which you can see is built off of two, uh, pretty good sized telephone poles. They're buried eight foot in the ground, uh, and then go up, I don't know, what was that 20 feet, something like that. Uh, and then on that pole system is a very thick, uh, piece of four inch pipe. Um, I think it's, I can't remember, schedule 40, schedule 80. Uh, it's at least a quarter of an inch thick. Um, extremely stout, not cheap, uh, but should last, uh, certainly outlast me. Um, and then it's mounted across, you can see here in the back, um, the two poles uh, sits on a piece of angle iron here that we've cut uh, holes out and then you can see on the pipe um, my friend Matt and I welded on a piece of flat stock I think it was 3 16 inch thick um, and then made a, a couple ears all the way down um, to give it a nice flat spot to support the uh, channel that the panels sit on and you can see the panels are on unistrut which is bolted again to this pivoting pipe. Uh, I've got a piece of angle iron on the bottom to make everything rigid, as well as to uh, bolt the adjustment pipe onto. Um, and that's pretty much it. So the panels themselves, uh, I actually got fairly cheap. They're used out of Arizona, if I remember right. They're 250 watt panels. I paid more for shipping than I did for the panels. Uh, I think that the uh, panels themselves were about $50. Uh, shipping, I think, for each one came out to about 60 or something like that. Um, but you can see we've got 10 of them. Um, they're, again, 250 watt panels. So the nameplate uh, capacity here is uh, 2,500 watts. Um, you get a lot more power in the winter than you do in the summer because the higher the temperature, uh, the more power you lose. But I would say the best I've ever seen out of this 2,500 uh, watts of panels was somewhere around 21, maybe 2,200 um, on a really cold day in the winter. Uh, and the panels themselves, even though they're used, they uh, check them out before they ship them and they're all uh, above, I think it's 98% of their nameplate capacity. So the panels themselves actually uh, work fine. Uh, it's just, you don't get bugs here. You don't get the power um, that you often hear talked about uh, in reality uh, from the sun. And of course, if there's any cloud cover at all, that uh, generation uh, capacity drops like an absolute rock. So if it's cloudy out, uh, even with these 10 panels rated at 2,500 watts, I'm lucky if I'm pulling in 200. Uh, for, so especially a cloudy, overcast, snowy day in the winter, I'm making, if I'm really lucky, about 100. So solar is a little bit tough. Um, you can't really believe the numbers that you see. But uh, if it is sunny, you can make some power uh, pretty good. And that would be 2,500 watts every hour 
uh, if it was actually producing 2,500. So think about how many hours of sun, sun, sun shine you have um, and you multiply that and that's how many you'll get uh, throughout the day. Um, with another caveat, and that is as the position of the sun changes, the power will um, obviously go up or down. Middle of the day, you get your, your highest output early and late. It starts waning off as the direction of the sun changes. And the other thing that uh, is a little bit of a challenge for us here is shade. If you get any shade on your panels at all, it really impacts all of them in that string. So the, the power will go down quite a bit uh, with shade. And I have a couple things here that work against me that um, I'm not really willing to change at the moment. So the first thing are trees. So you can see those trees right there, which unfortunately they're kind of important because they're on the hillside and I don't want to cut them down because I don't want the hill to fall down. Um, and that also provides a little bit of shade on my, sh my power shed, but most importantly, it keeps the hill up uh, and the sun comes up from over that direction. So in the morning it comes up over there, gets up to about there, and I don't really get uh, out of the shade until probably around 11 o'clock in the summer. In the winter, it's a little bit better because there's obviously not the leaves on the tree and the direction of the sun is a little different. Um, a different set of trees kind of block me a little bit, but I actually get sun a little earlier in the winter. So if I cut those down, I would get probably another two or three hours of sun, but you know, I don't want to. Um, and in the summer, I don't really need the power anyway, so it's not been that big of a problem. Uh, the other issue I have, you'll see that telephone pole that has a light on it and uh, an antenna. I really like that pole being up there because it provides me a high spot to mount things. But uh, as you can see right now, we are, actually, I don't know what time it is. I think it's about two o'clock in the afternoon in August and the sun has already started to hit the, the pole and it's shading the corner. So that string is already taking a hit on power consumption because some of the panels are shaded. And as the day goes on, that gets worse and worse. And then of course, the other thing I'll put you behind me, um, might not see it because of the sun, but the sun goes down over that hillside and you can see there's a ton of trees. So my day up on the side of the mountain here is a lot shorter than what you would get in you know, a flat area, uh, obviously, or, or in a place where you could significantly cut your, your tree cover down. So any given day, um, you know, I'd probably get somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, call it five to six hours of sun, somewhere in that range um, of decent sun. And if you assume uh, I'm gonna get a thousand watts of power you know, you, you multiply that by five, you get five kilowatts. Six would be six kilowatts, something like that. Um, today, again, is the middle of August. Uh, I looked earlier and I was pumping out, I think, about 1,500 watts. So that, that temperature hit uh, really drops your power output when it gets warm, um, at least in my situation. So uh, 1,500 watts, you know, multiply that by you know, four or five hours uh, for peak, and then it drops off after that. You know, I'm producing, you know, somewhere around five, six, seven kilowatts a day uh, if I have a nice clear day. The other thing um, about this is you can change the direction of the panels. It's really, people talk about that a lot. They have systems that you can pay a lot of money for that will change the panels with the direction of the sun uh, seasonally or even on a daily basis. The amount that you get out of that is actually pretty minimal um, if you look at a lot of the literature out there. So it generally isn't worth the cost uh, to go to those automated systems. Now what I have, uh, you can see it's obviously mounted on a pivotable pipe with only two connections. So I can rotate this whole thing up or down. Um, I have this unistrut that's attached to the pole and I can pull the panels out uh, for the summer. And actually I didn't even do it this summer because 
actually I didn't really need to, uh, but you can pull it out for the summer, get a little bit more power. In the winter, you put it more vertically. Uh, that does two things. One, the direction of the sun in the sky is lower, so you actually get more of a, a perpendicular uh, angle of attack for the sun coming in, so it's more efficient. And the other thing that's uh, a bigger deal is that the snow doesn't build up on the panels as much if they're more straight up and down. And, and even with my panels pretty steep, I get massive amounts of snow on there. So if I'm not up here um, with my squeegee taking the snow off, that can be a big problem. And that's one of the things in the future uh, that I would really like to do, but I'm kind of invested in this at the moment and it's really expensive. But uh, you can see these panels are monofacial, meaning that they have the um, collectors on one side and then the back side is silicon wafer which means that there's nothing happening on the back side they actually make panels called bifacial panels which have uh, active collectors on both the front and the back and those are actually a really big deal in a climate like me or mine ours uh, where the back side of the panel um, actually gets light reflected off of uh, buildings, so like this white shed here, um, or more importantly, snow. So in the winter, you'll actually get reflected light on the back of the panel, and it can get somewhere around 20, 25, 30% uh, energy bump because you're, you're collecting that backscattered light, um, which is nice, but the more important thing is that that light off the back hits the back of the panel, which obviously is not covered in snow, it starts collecting power, which generates heat, which heats the panel up, and then the front of the panel gets warm and all the snow supposedly melts and runs off of it without having to fool around with it. Um, for being up on the top of a mountain with a horrible amount of bad weather coming in, ice, snow, everything else, that's a big deal. Um, if I could go back in time, I probably would have shelled out more money for bifacial panels because I think in my circumstance, that's a pretty important thing is to be able to get the, the snow off the panels if I'm not up here. And I'm up here for maple syrup, syrup season. But other than that, uh, in the winter, there's long periods of time I'm not here, which means I can't do anything, which means I'm not making power. And eventually that means if I don't get power, my batteries go dead and then I'm in trouble. So um, that's one thing for the future. Uh, the way these panels come in, um, they're all kind of interconnect. You can make them in series and in parallel. They go through these cables here, which I have way too long because I wasn't sure where I was gonna put it and I haven't cut them off yet. Uh, but then it goes into my power shed. One thing I'll say, um, the other thing about these panels is there's a voltage and a current that comes out of them. These panels have, I think it's 37 and a half volts per panel. So if you put three panels together, you get, uh, what is that, 140 volts or something like that. Actually, I think it's less than that. I think it, I can't do the math in my head real fast, <laughs> but it's like 120. Um, and the reason that that's important, I'll go over my shed here, is you need to match that up with your inverter. And to have solar coming in, the uh, inverters have a range at which they can operate. They need a minimum voltage and a maximum voltage and the same thing on the current. Um, and your inverter will often say a certain capacity of how many watts of panels you can put on it. But the thing they don't really talk about a lot uh, in this industry, uh, at least not upfront to the layperson, is that you have to get that wattage within the constraints of voltage and current going into your inverter or either you don't have enough, it won't actually register in your charge controller and start charging. And if you have too much, you can burn the whole thing out. And you have to plan for the worst case scenario, which is what the panels are rated at. So that it, the open cir circuit voltage of 37 and a half, um, you don't get that most of the time. The only time you're going to get that is probably in the dead of winter when it's really cold out and the panels are super efficient. And even then, it probably is only going to spike if uh, the sun goes behind a cloud and comes out or something like that. 
then you would get a momentary spike um, it, it, as long as you were close to the that limit um, and it could fry your, your whole system. So you need to be under that open circuit voltage limitation. And that brings me to the second thing that I would really, uh, if I could go back in time, <laughs> um, I, I would really like to get a different inverter. Um, now granted the, the technology has moved in the last couple of years, but when you shell out 1500 bucks for an inverter, uh, you don't want to do it again two years later when the thing actually works. And what I have, I'm gonna have to shut the door here. This is an MPP 60, shoot, no, I don't remember. Actually, the book's here, 6048. Um, it was a pretty good inverter a couple of years ago. Uh, it's an all-in-one system, so it takes in your solar. Uh, it does the inverter to turn solar into uh, DC power so that you can charge your batteries. Uh, and then it has the inverter that takes DC power into AC so that you can kick out, you know, your normal house current. Uh, and the thing that's nice about this one is that it does both 120 and 240. It's called split phase. A lot of the inverters that have been on the market are single phase, which means they only output 120 volts. If you want 240, you actually have to get two of them and slave them together and one does one leg of 120 and the other does the other leg um, and you produce 240 that way. So this way, it's a smaller unit. It was lower cost. It's 6,000 watts, so 3,000 watts on each leg. Um, and you can either do 120 or 240, which is really nice. Now the problem is, and this is a big one, the solar input limitation on this has an open circuit voltage limit of 145 volts. So that's why my panel situation, each one of those is 37 and a half. I can only string together three panels in series. Um, before, if I put four, I go over. I think I hit 150 volts, something like that. Uh, so I'm five volts over. I could probably get away with it most of the time, but you are gonna get those momentary spikes, uh, again, mostly in the winter. Um, and you'd run the risk of blowing the whole thing out. So. I've got 10 panels. That means I have to do uh, two different strings because I have two inputs on this thing. One string I have to do uh, two sets of three. So I get three pa um, panels in a row that keeps me under that 145 volt open circuit voltage limit. Uh, and then I've got enough current that if I do two of those in parallel, I'm, I'm not even close to the current limit. Um, and then I have to do a second string if I remember right, I'm doing uh, a two by two. So two uh, sets of two in series, um, which really kind of stinks. I, I have 10 panels. It would be really nice to be able to put either all 10 together um, or two sets of five, uh, which would really simplify this. And then also allows me to easily add some more panels uh, further out in the, uh, the open area of our yard in the future if I wanted to like maybe some bifacials or something like that. Um, but I'm kind of stuck unless I want to shell out a bunch of money for a new inverter and this one's working. So um, it's a bit of a, a pickle, uh, but it, it's, and I upgraded my batteries today. Uh, I'm going to talk about that right now. So the problem is I put this um, server rack in here so you can't see all the stuff on my inverter, but it's actually pretty simple. Um, the, the, I'll see if you can see it. The red and black cables back there, they come up. I run them through a circuit breaker because solar panels do not turn off. If the sun's out, they make power and you don't want to get electrocuted. So I've got a, a two circuit breakers in there. They go up into the bottom of the panel and just connect in with a, a screw connector. It's pretty simple. It takes about two minutes to put it in. Um, in terms of the output, uh, I actually need to get a bigger line here. This is a only a, a 10 gauge, 10-3, actually 10-4 cable that I had left over. So I, I need to get a, a bigger one. And that's one of the things in the future. But um, you can see I'm, I've got it wired for 240. I've got a, two hots, a neutral and a ground. Goes over into my panel. Uh, and then in terms of the batteries, there's, can't see them because it's all the way over there, but uh, 
these big cables here go down, they go into a lug. Um, and that's what power from either from or to the battery uh, goes through the, the inverter. So all in all, you have a set of solar connectors, you have two battery terminals, and you have the, uh, the power output. Uh, and in my case, I'm obviously completely off grid uh, and have no options to go on grid. Um, I can hook a generator to this if I wanted to, uh, or if you were on the grid, you can tie into the grid. So you can run uh, grid-based power through here, which will then go and charge your batteries. Um, so if you wanted to use this as um, an emergency backup, or if you wanted to use it um, in conjunction with solar in your house where you're, you charge your batteries, use your own power as much as you can at night when the sun's not out, and then when you run out of power, it would switch over to the grid, um, that sort of thing. This is capable of doing that, but if you aren't on the grid, you can just leave the AC input empty and change one little setting in, in the control thing and it just runs fine uh, off grid. Um, I'll go over real quick uh, how I've got this wired. And again, I apologize, it's dark and crowded and I really need to move all of this into the other end of my shed uh, before winter because I need to be able to get my maple stuff in and out. And right now it's totally blocked. But this was set up when I was living in here <laughs> back when I was doing maple from my my little converted hunting blind slash uh, power shed now and I needed the space uh, along the wall to be able to put a cot um, but the the positive lead uh, comes out of the inverter goes through this which is called a t-class fuse I don't remember the rating I have on there I think it's between two and three hundred amps uh, but that's a very stout fuse you really want one of those, um, especially if you get more than one of these server rack batteries, because there can be a lot of amperage if something goes bad running through there. And if that starts happening, really bad things can happen. So you, you need to have a fuse on there. Even though every one of these batteries has its own breaker and in theory it shouldn't happen, um, that fuse really is is a, uh, a big safety feature. Um, and it wouldn't be a good idea to run one of these without it. Um, and I mentioned that I've upgraded um, today pretty significantly. So we went from having two uh, 5.2 kilowatt batteries to now having five, which should be, I'll knock on wood here, but that should be all the power we need. Uh, two actually would have been probably fine for normal circumstances with just a cabin, but considering I'm running my RO, which is this thing buried back behind our refrigerator, um, reverse osmosis machine for concentrating maple sap. Um, that thing's a power hog. And I ran it last year. I could get about one, about three quarters of a batch of sap done before I got the power low enough to where I was getting worried about it uh, and would have to switch to a generator. So by going from uh, essentially 10 kilowatts to 26 kilowatts, I'm hoping that uh, number one, I can run the RO and not have to worry about running out of power. But more importantly, um, since I am on the top of a mountain in West Virginia, I can have a lot more leeway to deal with cloudy days, um, snowy days, you know, stormy days, cloudy days, overcast, where I'm not generating a lot of power uh, and I don't have to you know, start biting my nails because I'm going to run out of juice. Um, I should have enough to make it multiple days. Um, if I'm not ROing, I can make it over a week before I have to worry about running out of power. And, and that's a pretty big deal. Uh, and I'll mention in a second why. Um, but in this case, again, this is a little bit jerry-rigged. It's not how it's going to be long term, but I'm coming out to these bus bars. Uh, my system has been set up to run to these two batteries. These cables are equal length. You need to have them all equal length. Um, I've just today added, again, this kind of jerry-rigged mess to the uh, uh, server rack here so I can get the other three batteries into the system. Uh, and I'll go over in a second what the challenge is and why it's not in its final state right now. But um, 
this is where this has been for the last couple years up here again in my shed which is highly insulated i had this box that i built around it you can see it's all insulated um i ran it off of a thermal cube which i don't know where i put it but uh it's a pretty common thing it's a thermostatic switch it turns on at i think 35 degrees and turns off at 34 uh 45 degrees the thing with these batteries is they can't freeze um, if they go below freezing they'll still output power for a while i don't remember what the low temperature for output is but where you run in the problems is if you hit the freezing point you know so 32 degrees for us and zero degrees for all the uh the weirdos out there that use the metric system um if it hits the freezing point they won't charge uh you what will happen in the batteries is some bad chemistry you start plating out lithium metal uh, on your anodes it completely kills the life of the batteries and in a really bad case um not as much with these types but the other more traditional lithium ion batteries that plated lithium can actually lead to ultimately a fire um so there's control mechanisms in these batteries that shut them off from charging if it's below freezing and being up here at close to 4,000 feet um last year i think we had the lowest temperature i registered outside was minus 18 and in here it got down i think it was somewhere around 15 degrees in the shed um, and that was when we weren't here but my temperature logger got it so that insulated box is a big deal because these batteries create heat when they discharge and charge so they make their own heat which allows them to um, survive in a cold environment even if it's below freezing outside but as added insurance for my situation uh, what I've got here is a chicken heater that goes in with um, baby chickens. So you can incubate eggs or chicks in that, and you can either screw it to a wall or it has legs on it. I think I got it at Tractor Supply. Uh, it's made so that you can hover in the air and the chickens can go stand underneath it and stay warm and not freeze to death, that kind of thing. But for me, um, the fact that I could bolt it to the wall, it's fairly flat really worked well because I put that insulated box, I put the chicken heater in here, I put the thermostatic switch connected to the heater switch, and that way if the inside of that box got down below 35, that heater would kick on, um, create a, enough heat to just basically keep it above freezing and everything would stay running. Um, and the problem with my system is twofold. If it does go too cold, and it shuts off and it won't charge, then that means that my batteries will have depleted and it shuts off and I can't restart it unless I get everything warm again and hope I have enough voltage. So the only way I could do that would be if I had like a propane heater or something and I'd have to let it come in here and sit uh, for maybe a day and uh, heat the place up and then I could turn things back on. The other challenge is my inverter and this is the other reason i would really like a different inverter but this inverter has to have battery power to run so if the sun is shining outside and i'm making huge amounts of power with the panels and it's coming in but my inverter is off because the batteries are dead the inverter will not turn on uh, and that's kind of the legacy of of my system here so i started with one battery in the shed uh, as I was approaching fall, I was worried about getting too cold. Uh, and what I actually did is this light bulb, which is LED right now, I didn't do the math right. I bought a 100 watt light bulb. I put it in there and I turned it on. And I thought, well, that would heat the shed. You know, you always hear about LEDs are better uh, because they don't heat your house up. Well, in my case, I don't mind the heat, um, especially in the winter of an incandescent bulb. What I didn't do is the basic math on if you take a 100 watt bulb and you run that for 24 hours a day, how much power does that use? Well, it's 100 watts every hour. So you can multiply 100 times 24 hours, you're using two and a half kilowatts of power every day just running that bulb. And that bulb did a fantastic job of keeping the shed 
excessively warm. Um, as I looked at my temperature logger, it was, it was nice uh, in here. But the problem was we ended up getting a storm that came through and we had no sun for basically, I think it was five days. And I had one battery, it's 5.2 kilowatts. And I was running a 100 watt bulb, which was using two and a half. So I was using half of my battery capacity every day, just running that light bulb. Um, the other thing you have to account for is this inverter is not the most efficient. Uh, I think it runs, they don't actually state it, but I've seen some things online, somewhere between 60 and 70 watts um, of consumption just running the inverter, just sitting there idle. So you now take 70 watts plus 100 watts, and I have, you know, less than two days worth of power in one of those batteries in that circumstance. And what happened is um, I actually was on a work trip. Uh, I ended up in this direction of the country. After my work trip got over, I was gonna stop here on the weekend and change the oil in my tractor. And I showed up thinking everything would be hunky-dory because I had this light bulb on. Uh, actually, I was a little worried it might have been too cold because it had snowed actually for a couple of the days. And, and this was in September, if I remember right, very early snow. Um, so I get to the shed and I open the door and there's no noise. And you, I don't know if you can hear it in the background, but this thing actually is pretty loud, especially if you're sleeping in here. And the first thing I thought is, oh no, my battery's froze. Well, I came to find out they didn't freeze. Well, they didn't freeze until I ran the entire thing out of power because I had that light bulb running. So when I did the math, it was kind of like, yeah, I'm an idiot. Um, I should have done a little bit of calculations on that. And of course it went dead. So lesson learned. Um, I had to take the thing home, uh, charge it, which you have to use a 48 volt charger. And I guess that's the other thing I didn't say. These batteries are lithium iron phosphate. So it's the safest lithium ion chemistry that you can get. Uh, in theory, these things don't go through thermal runaway, which means that if you're gonna put it in a structure um, or on a boat or in an RV, this is the kind of battery that you actually wanna use. Um, they are fundamentally safe. Now, none of these things are 100% safe, but it's night and day compared to your more traditional lithium ion batteries that use you know, um, LCO or NMC or something like that uh, for their, their active material. Iron phosphate is very stable. It has essentially the same voltage profile as lead acid. So it's a drop in for the electronics in most cases. They're now starting to put them in cars. Um, it's a good technology. Um, it's got way longer cycle life than what you have with your traditional um, lithium ion chemistry. So these things, should in theory these things are going to last more than 20 years uh, and even at that point the capacity is going to go down to maybe 80 percent or so um you know it, it, they're still going to work and, and actually you're going to run out of time where chemistry is just going on by them sitting here before in all likelihood you run out of cycles on the batteries because any of these lithium ion batteries once you start them chemistry for degradation just starts going and you can't turn it off. So there's a limited amount of shelf life that they have on top of the cycle life. So with cars and things like that, you're using up the cycle life before the shelf life. In this case, um, I'm more than likely going to use up the shelf life, which is somewhere around 20 years before I'm using up the cycle life, if that makes sense. So that's what these batteries are. After that hard lesson, I actually went and bought a second one, thinking that I needed to have enough of a buffer, uh, especially because of, of the cloudy days. And that's what I've had for the last couple of years. And it's mostly been pretty good. Um, I've had a few times where I've had around a week of really bad weather when I've been up here, like during maple season, and my power has gotten really low to the point where I've stopped using most things um, that weren't absolutely critical to try to wait for a sunny day to come out. Um, and if I get a sunny day, a, a really nice one, especially in the winter, I can fully recharge these things in, in one day generally uh, with good sun. But again, 
the inverter is burning 60 or 70 watts and if it's cloudy you know it's routinely um the case where i'm only making 100 150 maybe 200 watts depending on on how cloudy it is so i'm barely able to make enough power to just cover the inverter losses um the other thing i've done um is I've added a refrigerator and this one is just brand new. So I got batteries in a refrigerator um, today uh, that are installed. What I had before is this little guy, which was way too small um, and the freezer was horrible. So um, that's what I actually ran last year was that little one. And to be honest, having that in the shed with the batteries charging and discharging it did a really good job of keeping this place, you know, above freezing most of the time. So I don't even know if that chicken heater was used last year, even though it got cold in the shed, because I'm betting that the uh, insulated box was probably enough to keep it warm. Um, unfortunately, I don't know if it turned on or not, but that's, uh, that's how I've been. Now here's what I've got. So I've got this door I should have left the door off that I had, but, um, so I've got this server rack and you can see it looks like a server for, for computer networks. Um, it's got, it's kind of dark. I apologize, but it's got slots in here. Um, this being for batteries, you've got a bus bar. So the positive side and negative side, uh, you can see these, these batteries, you know, that they are modular. They're designed to just slide right into these racks. So this one can hold six. Um, you put little arms on the side of these batteries. They bolt in again, just like a computer server. You hook them to the bus bar. You hook the bus bar to the inverter system and away you go. Uh, you'll notice that I have three in here and I still have my two down on the floor, um, which the good thing about this iron phosphate server rack batteries is unlike lead acid, there's no liquid in there so they're not directional you can put them any way you want you can stand them up put them on their side put them flat like this uh, it, it doesn't really impact the way that they operate so this server rack is really convenient um, now granted i just got it we'll see if there i have any problems but uh, you can imagine these things they weigh about 100 pounds a piece so that's in my case so i've got 500 pounds worth of batteries here so they're cumbersome they take up a lot of space um, if you can put them in a rack like this, it takes a lot less space. And you can see in this thing, I don't have a lot of space. It's hard to believe I ever lived here um, for the first winter I did syrup. But um, being able to stack all five of these is really convenient. And it's on wheels and I can move it around. So I'm probably going to end up having to move all of my power from this side over to that side, which is inconvenient because I'm gonna have to take the whole thing apart, shut everything down, move the hardy board over there because you, you mount it on a, uh, a non-flammable surface and rewire all my circuits and all that sort of stuff. But I really need to be able to get access to just inside the door because I need to put my RO in here when I'm using it because uh, you can't let it freeze overnight or it will ruin it. Um, and right now I don't think I can get it in here with all this crowding, but for the time being it's in here. Uh, you'll notice I don't have all five of the batteries in the rack. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is that um, I needed to get it going and charged and I didn't want to shut it off. So I actually hooked all this up when it was still live. Luckily it didn't blow anything up or electrocute myself, but um, I've got the, the three new ones charging right now. And, and when everything gets topped off, then I can kind of wheel and deal in terms of what I put on and what I put off. But um, I've got two problems that actually make it a little bit challenging. One is I've got some cable. You'll notice, I'm going to shut this here. You'll notice this cable here that's red and black uh, that goes down to these is pretty heavy stuff. I don't remember what gauge it is, but I bought that with a crimper. Um, I, I subsequently turned the crimper back to Amazon because it was a complete piece of junk, but um, heavy gauge stuff. And you can put some serious amps through this and I don't want to run the risk of burning out cables. Um, I have more of this left, but I don't have a crimper. 
And so what I've done to hook this rack up is I've used my old battery cables that I got from Napa or something like that when I had this first hooked up with just one battery. And it's long enough to get in there and hit the bus bars off of these, um, these other bus bars I, I had on the wall before. But you can tell that it's a much smaller gauge cable than what I have here. So I really need to get a, um, a longer, heavier duty cable go right off my T-class fuse, get rid of these bus bars, get it into the the server rack. And the same thing on the negative side. You know, I come down here um, and hit the the bus bar. Really, you know, I could probably get one of these and get it in there, but that gets to be way too many connections. I need to get one piece of wire that goes from the inverter all the way into the rack. Uh, so that I'm not running multiple connections. But for the time being, it'll work. Uh, the other thing is, when I bought the first two batteries back in the day, um, again, I didn't have a server rack, so I didn't worry about it, but these are the wires they sent me, um, and I just threw them in a box. I assumed they were the same as the ones that, the three that I just took out of the boxes today. Um, they weren't. These are... 16 square millimeters, which I have no idea what that even means, but um, the ones that they've provided with the current batteries are one gauge, um, noticeably thicker again. And the thing with these server racks, with any of these battery systems, you really want your cables to be exactly the same for every battery, because if you have a shorter uh, path to run between the inverter and the battery, that battery is gonna get preferential charging and discharging over the others, which means that you're putting all your wear and tear on one battery, all your amps are coming out of one cable, um, you know, until you kind of overload it and you run the risk of, of damage, um, and ultimately fires and things like that. So really you wanna have everything exactly the same length, the same um, diameter cables, you wanna split where your bus bars are attached to diagonally. So your positive comes in on the top, your negative goes out or uh, yeah, come on the bottom. And then that way your power is going across your entire rack and not, you know, all in the top or all in the bottom kind of thing. And, and then you would be, you know, preferentially hitting either the top or the bottom battery. So th there's a little bit of, uh, art, I guess you would say that to putting these things together um, so that you make everything balanced. Um, right now I've got it hooked up and it's working, but I uh, obviously am going to need to have something a little bit more legit by the time I'm done. But right now everything's good. So I went from 10 kilowatt hours to 26 and uh, it makes me feel a little bit better. But again, I need to um, think long term about my panels and whether buying some bifacials is really worth it. And again, it's a lot of money. Um, and generally they're a little bigger too. So I, I may have to even think about my uh, arrangement on my pipe out there. And then probably the more shorter term thing is, do I get another inverter? Um, and again, they, they have a number of inverters out there. I think this, the same company that uh, I got my batteries from. So you can see these are, um, EG4 batteries is what they are from Signature Solar. They have an EG4 inverter. I think it's called the 6500, which again is an off-grid um, design system. They also have on-grid design systems, but that one is still 6,000 watts of output, which so far I haven't needed any more than that, but it has a much more robust um, solar input set up on their solar charge controller. I think it goes out where this one's 145 volt max. I think it goes to 500 if I remember right, which means I could take all my um, panels and string them all together in one string, um, which means I could add a complete another array just like I have out there on the second string and still have room to spare. And that would be a big deal. But, you know, is it worth going out and getting another inverter with money I don't have um, when this thing still keeps running. Um, and, and I haven't had any problems with the inverter actually running. You know, once I got the set points right to making it shut off 
um, when the voltage got to the right conditions and um, the heating thing situated and knowing what I should run or what I shouldn't run. Now this thing has just sat there and run and run and run and run. So um, it's been actually really reliable. Um, it's run my RO, which is a 120 um, system. Uh, I didn't want to have to deal with 240 because my generator is only 110 and I don't have a 240 uh, extension cord. But, you know, obviously if you can run 240 that on a motor, that's generally better because you're pulling less amps. But um, I'm running this, this RO, which is, again, an energy hog. It's got two motors on it. Um, really pulls the power and this thing handled it no problem now if you came in the shed when it was running this thing's screaming <laughs> but uh never had a hiccup um same thing when the sun is really out you know the, the, this thing changes pitch based on how much power is either going in or out of it and it can get to be really noisy so i would say that's the other bad thing about this inverter is if you actually have it in your house or if you happen to be sleeping in the power shed that your your inverters in the thing is loud uh you can tell when the sun comes out because it just starts screaming uh so it, it's something to consider if you're actually putting it in your house um it's going to make some noise and it makes some heat too uh and, and i guess that's the other thing to to say um now that i've got my cabin i thought about moving all this over there i'd have to put a, a fairly long run of the solar wires in and you're going to obviously lose uh, power because you know running two three hundred feet of cable is is uh, a, a power loss but i had to ask myself do i first want a noisy inverter in my cabin which is limited space and then secondly even though these are about as safe as you're going to be able to find for battery systems there's never no risk um you know if something happens and they do go off they shouldn't, and they shouldn't go off, you know, explosively like most of the other lithium ion chemistry out there. But if something does happen and they do go, they can burn. And, you know, you're going to have to contend with that. And do you really want that in your living space, especially if you have, you know, a, a loft like we do. So you have people upstairs and you have to think about egress and, you know, getting out on a porch roof and jumping off and that sort of thing. Um, not worth the risk of burning my cabin down is a decision I came to. So I'm leaving this shed here. Uh, it's going to be my storage slash power shed. Um, I've got, I think 250 feet of, I believe it's two gauge aluminum direct burial cable sitting over by my cabin. So once I finish with the roof, um, that's the next job. So That'll probably be when I move all the electrical stuff over to the other side of the shed, um, rewire all everything in here to make it more convenient. Put the um, panel here over on the other side where the cable would be coming in from the cabin. Hopefully that's a long enough cable. Uh, I measure it, I think it's okay, but um, that'll be my next thing because right now I'm doing uh, what is pretty much you're told never to do uh, for my cabin and it's been this way for almost a year now. I'm running three extension cords from this shed um, over to the cabin. So three 100 foot extension cords to get power in there. And then of course I have a surge protector that has six or eight or whatever plugs on it that everything goes into. So um, you know, you're not supposed to run an extension cord into an extension cord into an extension cord into a surge protector. Um, I'm losing a lot of voltage and you can hear it in, in, uh, things like drill motors and that sort of thing when you run it. But, uh, so far it's worked. I haven't really had any problems with it. Um, the only thing I've even noticed is the newer TV I put in the cabin to watch the Olympics seems to be a little bit more voltage sensitive because the old small one I had, you could do anything you want and it never missed a beat. This new one, actually it resets the TV. If you turn on a, like a um, chop saw or something like that on that circuit. So uh, other than that, I actually haven't seen anything bad, but you know, of course you're, you're putting wear and tear on your electrical motors. Uh, 
after you're running that many uh, lines because you a voltage drop over distance. So uh, the cable I have is way oversized, uh, should be way more than anything I need, um, especially in that cabin and anything heavy I wanna run, I'm gonna run directly out of this shed anyways. So um, that's kind of the, the longer term plan. So again, um, lithium iron phosphate batteries, I went from about 10 to 26 kilowatt hours now. In theory, I should be more than set for anything I could ever want. Um, we'll see, famous last words. But I do have one extra slot in the server rack if I needed to put another one in. Right now, my plan is to take that chicken heater and actually put that in the bottom of this thing in that empty slot with the thermostatic uh, switch and probably run some insulation on the outside because this is just a metal cabinet. There's no insulation on it. Um, I'm probably gonna insulate this thing for the winter, put that chicken heater in there and kind of have a big version of what I was running um, the last couple of years just to try to make sure everything stays warm. I figure if it's on the bottom, that's pretty good because heat rises and it should keep everything warm, but we'll see. Um, but then, you know, running the cable, do I do anything about bifacial panels? And at what point do I uh, change my inverter to something that's a little bit more robust on the, uh, the solar input side of things? And at least at this point, I haven't run into output issues, but uh, there are some other uh, systems out there that are a little bit more expensive that really significantly jump your, uh, your output. So, you, you know, you're talking from a, 3,000 watts per leg on this. There, there are four, five, six, um, and even some higher ones out there that are really providing a lot of power. So I don't think I need that, but the input side of it's probably where I'm gonna have to go because um, again, cloudy days, I've got battery storage now. The next thing I, I might have to do is add some more panels. So I might be looking at putting another array up um, in hopefully right in front of the other one where I have a little, maybe even a little bit more sun than what I have today. So um, hopefully that uh, answers more questions than I created. Um, again, a lot of this is work in progress. Um, probably don't uh, look too heavily at some of the things I've done here because there's uh, definitely things that need to be fixed up and I will get them fixed up. But uh, at this point it's, uh, it, it's working and it's, fairly safe, <laughs> but um, it, it'll be a lot better here probably in the next uh, six to 12 months when I get everything finished. So sign it off. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. And if you have any questions, just uh, put some comments uh, down below and I'll try to address them if I can. So thanks.